here I've got a nice problem which I think is at the level of a mid-range homework problem from a real analysis course which you would take maybe as a junior or a senior in college. So I'm not teaching real analysis this semester but sometimes I do and I kind of wanted to do a real analysis problem so that's why we're here. Okay, let's recall the following definition. So a sequence of real numbers is called Cauchy if for all epsilon bigger than zero, there is a natural number n such that if m and n are bigger than capital N, and we can put them in order as m is bigger than n is bigger than capital N, then the difference between a m and a n is less than epsilon. So I've got some other videos where we look at Cauchy sequences. We're not going to do that here. So I'm going to introduce another notion, and that is a contractible sequence. So a sequence is called contractible if there exists an alpha between 0 and 1 such that a n plus 2 minus a n plus 1 is less than alpha times a n plus 1 minus a n. So in other words, the difference between consecutive terms is contracting over time. And this inequality has to hold for all natural numbers n. So our goal is to show that every contractible sequence is in fact a Cauchy sequence. And then a standard result from a course like this will show that every Cauchy sequence actually converges. I'll let you guys check that proof if you need to. Okay, so let's maybe do a little bit of scratch work or a little bit of exploration first, and then we'll write down a careful proof. So, like I said, we're going to start by exploring. So let's say that we know that m is bigger than n and we want to look at the size of the object a m minus a n. So how can we get a handle on the size of this? Well, contractibility says we can only say something about the size of consecutive terms. So we probably want to put this in terms of consecutive terms. So we'll do that by adding and subtracting a bunch of copies of the same thing. So I'm going to rewrite this as a m minus a m minus 1 plus a m minus 1 minus a m minus 2 plus a m minus 2 all the way down to a n plus 1 minus a n. So just to reiterate, I've added that type of term in there, which is equal to zero. I've added this type of term, which has a pair with it right here, which is also equal to zero, and then so on and so forth. Now I want to apply the triangle inequality. That'll allow us to take this large absolute value and break it into a bunch of absolute values. So this is going to be less than or equal to, I guess, the absolute value of a m minus a m minus 1 plus the absolute value of a m minus 1 minus a m minus 2 plus all the way down to the absolute value of a n plus 1 minus a n. So like I said, that's just a standard application of the triangle inequality. Okay, but now we want to get all of these in terms of this guy over here. And we can do that by applying our contraction. Okay, so let's maybe do that. So I'm going to apply the contraction to just this first term, which I boxed in yellow first. So this is going to be strictly less than, by the definition of the contraction, alpha times a m minus 1 minus a m minus 2. And then we have all of the rest of the terms are staying the same. So a m minus 1 minus a m minus 2 all the way down to a n plus 1 minus a n like that. Okay, but what can we do from there? Well, we can actually combine these thinking about them as like terms. So we've got this absolute value of a m minus 1 minus a m minus 2 both in both of these places. One of them is attached to an alpha and one of them is not. So this is equal to alpha plus 1 times the absolute value of a m minus 1 minus a m minus 2 plus the absolute value of a m minus 2 minus a m minus 3 and then we're taking that all the way down to a n plus 1 minus a n. 
So I've included this term, which is just like in our dots over there. Okay, now we're gonna do this again. We'll apply the contraction to this guy right here to write it in terms of this guy right here, which I'll maybe put overlined in red. So applying the contraction again, I have alpha plus one, this should be an inequality, times alpha, times the absolute value of am minus two minus am minus three, plus the absolute value of am minus two minus am minus three, and then that's going to descend all the way down to a n plus 1 minus a n. That's an absolute value as well. Okay, but now we see that we've got more like terms. This thing which I'm overlining in green and this other one which is overlined in green. Those are like terms. So we can put them together and see that we have alpha squared plus alpha plus one times that object a m minus two minus a m minus three plus all the way down to a n plus one minus a n. Okay, so let's maybe bring that up and then we'll continue our calculation. Okay, so on the last part, we ended up with the following inequality. Our goal object is less than this polynomial evaluated at alpha times a m minus two minus a m minus three, all the way down to a n plus one minus a n. So next what we can do is continue applying this contraction to all of these terms, except for the last one. So we'll pick up a factor of alpha for all of those applications. Okay, so I'll just kind of like put dots for that, but suffice it to say, this isn't too hard to show. So here you get that this is alpha m minus n plus alpha m minus n minus 1 all the way down to alpha plus 1 times the absolute value of a n plus 1 minus a n, like that. Okay, great. But next, I want to notice that this finite sum is most definitely smaller than the corresponding infinite sum. So I can just add on all of the rest of the powers of alpha. That's gonna give me one plus alpha plus alpha squared, and that goes on forever. And then I have a n plus one minus a n. Okay, but since alpha is between zero and one, this converges and it converges to a well-known value. So this is gonna be equal to the absolute value of a n plus one minus a n over one minus alpha, just by the sum of the geometric series. Okay, but now we can apply our contraction to this single absolute value here. So if we apply our contraction to that single absolute value over and over and over, well, let's see what we get after one step. This is gonna be less than alpha over one minus alpha times a n minus a n minus one, which is in turn less than alpha squared over one minus alpha a n minus one minus a n minus two. Now I think you can see what we're doing. We're gonna take that all the way down until we have a2 minus a1. And what will the power of alpha be? Well, I believe it's gonna be n minus one. So this is gonna be less than alpha to the n minus one over one minus alpha times a2 minus a1. Okay, great. So let's bring that up. And we're almost done with our exploration and ready to turn this into a little bit more careful of a proof. So the last board ended with the following inequality. We had our goal object is less than alpha to the n minus one over one minus alpha times the absolute value of a two minus a one. Now I wanna notice that this stuff which I am squaring in green is a constant. Alpha two minus alpha one is never changing. One minus alpha is never changing. Furthermore, we know that since alpha is between zero and one as n gets larger and larger and larger. In other words, as n goes to infinity, this guy is going to go to zero. So that gives us some motivation for how to pick our 
capital N given our epsilon in our proof that this is Cauchy. So let's maybe go ahead and dive into that. So now we're gonna prove that this is actually a Cauchy sequence. So I'll put a star right here on this arrow to just note that that is the arrow that I'm proving. Okay, so let's say we are given some epsilon bigger than zero. Let's go ahead and take our natural number capital N such that alpha to the capital N minus one is less than epsilon times one minus alpha over the absolute value of A2 minus A1. This might seem problematic because what if A2 is equal to A1? We're dividing by zero. Well, let's just assume that A2 is different than A1. I'll let you guys work out as a homework problem what happens if they are the same. So maybe post in the comments what happens if A2 is equal to A1. Okay, so let's talk about why we know this can be made this small. That's because this object is tending off towards zero. Okay, but now we're pretty much ready to go. So let's maybe suppose that M and N are bigger than capital N, where M is bigger than N. And then that means that we have AM minus AN is less than, well, this thing up here by our exploration. So we've got this is less than alpha to the N minus one over one minus alpha times absolute value of A2 minus A1. But given the fact that N is bigger than N, we know that this thing right here is less than this thing right here. So we've got this is less than alpha to the N minus one over one minus alpha times absolute value of A2 minus A1. But then that capital N was chosen so that this inequality held. So we can insert the right-hand side of the inequality over there. So that means this is less than epsilon times one minus alpha over absolute value of A2 minus A1 times absolute value of A2 minus A1 over one minus alpha. Again, what I did is I just took this thing right here and replaced it with this, given this inequality. But now let's notice that a bunch of stuff cancels. This cancels with this, this cancels with this, and we see that this object is equal to epsilon. So what did we do? We were given some arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero, and we were able to find a capital N such that if N and N are both bigger than that capital N, then the difference between AM and AN is less than epsilon, which is exactly what we need for this thing to be Cauchy. And that's a good place to stop.